that, uh, there won't even be, be a beginning of a law and order response to these corporate violations. And what will happen is it'll just continue and it'll erode the economy to a point where we'll see some very severe macro collapses. You know, it, it wasn't Ronald Reagan that brought down Soviet communism. It was corruption, vertical, horizontal, endemic. It resulted in no bread on the tables, no bread in the stores, apparatchiks. One thing that's quite interesting is how big business is destroying capitalism itself. Now, this is a rather oxymoronic statement, but it does illustrate that the system that's evolving in our country is not capitalism. It's corporate socialism, defined as the follows. That the government is taken over by these corporations, as is our elections, as is our two parties. And the government's prime function is to service these corporations with inflated government contracts, such as the military contracts, with giveaways of our natural resources and our intellectual capital, like NIH, research and development and tested pharmaceuticals, and to bail out uh, and otherwise assume the risks of corporate corruption, mismanagement, uh, or speculation. And that means the government is turned against its principal service constituency, which is the people, and it becomes part of the corporate matrix. That's what corporate socialism is where they privatize their profits and socialize their risks and their losses. Now, capitalism is quite different from that. And the way these corporations are destroying capitalism is the following. The first assumption of capitalism is if you own property, you control it. Well, the shareholders own the, pro own the corporations, but they don't control it. We own the public lands, but we don't control it. We own the public airways, and we don't control it. The corporations do. So whether it's community ownership of property, like the public lands or the public airways, or whether it is individual ownership, like individual shares, the electoral process of a corporate entity actually is even more harsh than the Kremlin process of elections. There is one slate. There is no competition for electing the board of directors. There's no cumulative voting. No matter how large a shareholder you are in these big corporations, you can't even find who your fellow shareholders are, names and addresses, without litigating it. And the power is in the hands of the, of the executives and the board of directors, which are rubber stamps because they're selected by the executives. And the executives use the corporate money to win the election. And if you, as a shareholder, or other shareholders want to challenge, you've got to use your money, and you don't get reimbursed even if you win, and so on and so forth. So the first violation is they split ownership from control. Now, when you allow people to own and not control, that's a pacification technique and a controlling process. The people own $5 trillion of pension money, the workers, they do not control it. It's controlled either by the corporation or by the banks and insurance companies. The second principle of capitalism is it's supposed to be sink or swim. You open a business, if you meet the customer's needs, you swim, and if you don't, the verdict of the marketplace says you sink. Not if you're a big company. If you're a big company, with a few egregious exemptions that are so criminal, like Enron, if you're a big company, you don't go bankrupt, you go to Washington for a bailout, or an industry is bailed out completely whether it's the SNL industry or the defense industry or whatever. And there are lots of different kinds of, ba of bailouts. Very complex ways, tax expenditures, depreciation allowances, straight out cash subsidies, handouts, guarantees, tossing them certain government contracts the way the, the government did to, to save McDonnell Douglas a few years back. The third principle of capitalism is freedom of contract. That's a very important pillar of capitalism. 
Do you think you have freedom of contract? When was the last time you amended any contract that you signed, whether it's an auto insurance policy, a landlord lease, whether it's a HMO agreement, a hospital waiver agreement, whether it's a bank deposit card for the Bank of America, whether it's an auto dealer contract when you bought a car, just try and change any of the fine print. Cross out a few paragraphs here, double the warranty there, and then say, here, sign on the dotted line. See where it gets you. If you don't like the fine print standard form contract, you go across the street to a competitor, it's the same contract. Have you ever seen the shrink wrap license? You know, the Microsoft? And here's a contract you agree to before you even see it. Never mind anybody can understand it. Before you buy the contract, before you use the product, before you buy it, it's there. And it's shifting all the responsibilities uh, to the buyers and uh, achieving immunities and privileges for the seller. Very few contracts now are negotiated except between important units like labor unions and management or between companies. But the vast trillions and trillions of dollars that change hands are basically on conditions that reflect the private legislature of corporations. All that fine print in your credit application form, all that fine print in all these contracts you sign, those are private corporate regulations. And you can't do anything about it. 